Welcome to Chapter 7, The Presidency. My name is Jerry Elick, Instructor of Political Science here at Langston University. And today I will go over Chapter 7 in Welcome about the presidency. Chapter 7, The Presidency. My name is Jerry Elick, Instructor of Political Science here at Langston University. All right, I apologize for that. All right. Today, uh, we're gonna talk about the presidency and how much power the president truly does have. Uh, the president does have things uh, to uh, uh, list it in the Constitution or express or enumerate in the Constitution that gives the executive branch and the office of the president power. However, in order to gain power or in order to use that power, Congress, must pass a law in order to provide the president the power. However, the president do, does have something called executive orders or executive uh, abilities in order to, uh, in order to uh, wield power. Now, these, these abilities have the same effect on law. They're, they're called executive orders, proclamations or memos, but they only last as long as that president is in office. When another president comes in, the next president could just totally change it. Also, the checks and balance against these executive, uh, executive abilities, uh, Congress can declare them unconstitutional, the judicial branch can declare them unconstitutional. And even better, uh, these powers are not necessarily invested in the president. They had to have already been approved by Congress based on law. And the president is just simply uh, choosing to enforce or not enforce an existing law. And that's what gives executive abilities its power. So let's get started with the PowerPoint, and you know I don't like PowerPoints. However, for the case of this, I use PowerPoints more as an outline. But let's get it started, get it done, and get it taken care of. All right, let's get to it. Now, as I share my screen, uh, you can see the upcoming PowerPoint. All right, chapter seven, uh, the presidency. Our objectives today is to describe the constitutional provisions that provide the roots of the American presidency, identify the roles and responsibilities of the president under the Constitution, trace the expansion of presidential power, describe the organization and functions of the executive office of the president, and describe the relationship between the president and the public, and describe the relationship between the president and the Congress. All right. So let's start with the roots of the office of the president of the United States. The president qualifications and terms of office are, uh, in order to be the president of the United States, the day in which you are, you put your hand up and swear an oath to the constitution of the United States as the president of the United States, you must have attained the age of 35 years, have been living in the United States for at least 14 years and a natural born citizen of the United States. That's it. It's real simple. Again, by the time you put your right hand up to swear to uh, support and defend the Constitution of the United States, you must be at least 35 years of age. You must have lived in the United States for 14 years. And you must be a natural born citizen. That is the only qualification for president in the Constitution. Everything else is just simply determined by the public. What the public feels, who should be a president. Now, the rules of succession is very easy. If something happens to the president, the vice president takes over. If something happened to the vice president and the president at the same time, then the speaker of the house, and so on and so forth. 
and we will get more into this. Now, one of the things is about the qualifications in terms of office is that uh, people, people uh, fear the executive power of the pre presidency. Now, I talked to you about the qualifications of the office, but as in being elected president until uh, the 1950s, the president could be elected to office as many times as he ran or she ran. Uh, George Washington was the first president in the United States and he served two terms as president. And then after the second term, he, he uh, bowed out and says, I will not seek another term. And based upon the actions of George Washington, every president thereafter who served more than one term after the second term gladly left. Until 1932, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was uh, elected president. He served a full three terms in office from 1933 to 1945 when he passed away. And he was elected four full terms, served three full terms, and only lasted about maybe a little bit more than 100 days in the fourth term. Then Harry S. Truman took his place. At that time, it is just the fear of a president serving so long. Also, a lot of historians also said since the Republicans were in charge of Congress, they didn't want another popular Democrat taking office, and they wanted to limit the term of the presidency. Uh, and I, I thought that was funny because uh, if that was true, obviously they were very short-sighted, but if you look at politicians, they normally are short-sighted because in 1980, when Reagan came in, Reagan could have stayed president for at least three terms because he was popular enough in 1988 when his term ended and Vice President George H.W. Bush won his first term and only term as president. And really, that was all the coattails of Reagan. So because of the fear of executive power, and maybe because of the politics of Republican Democrats, the 22nd Amendment was passed through Congress and was adopted throughout the states. And at that time, and from that time on, no president can serve no more than two terms in office. That's it two terms at office or 10 years. Now the 10 years comes from this. Say if a president becomes incapacitated or a president dies in office and a vice president takes over. The vice president under the constitution can serve out the, the preceding president's term and then run for office themselves. In the Constitution, under the 22nd Amendment, that person can run for another full term and serve the full term that they've won and maybe serve an additional two years. But after 10 years, no other, no, you cannot serve an additional term. So let's look at this point of view. President Obama was elected in 2008 served from 2009 to January, 2017. President Obama served two full terms. That means President Obama is no longer eligible to run for president of the United States. However, President Trump was elected in 2017, swore, I mean 16, sworn in office in 2017 and was defeated by President Biden in 2020, and his term ended in 2021, President Trump can serve an additional term if he were to run for president 
and win. That's how that works. But if President Trump were to win in 2024, President Trump would serve out his term and would not be eligible to run again because he would have served two terms in office. Also, in the Constitution, the president can be impeached for uh, high crimes and misdemeanors. But the problem with this is impeachment is high crimes and misdemeanors are not definitively defined in the Constitution. So many scholars based on how other lower members or judicial members have been impeached have based their assumptions off what is impeachable for a president in the United States. Executive privilege. Presidents have claimed executive privilege and many of them, and really it started with Nixon, has claimed that the president has certain rights which is implied in the constitution for the president to do their job. Many times the Supreme Court has come back and says executive privilege is not necessarily constitutional and executive privilege will always be claimed, but chances are the interpretation of the Supreme Court on the constitution will deny it. Now the rules of secession. The Presidential Secession Act and the 25th Amendment has come into play because it was a scenario in which either the president could be incapacitated or when the 25th Amendment ha had been adopted, we are in an age of nuclear annihilation. So if for some reason that the president of the United States is either incapacitated or need to be incapacitated, or that a cataclysm has occurred, that the president of the United States and the vice president of the United States were incapacitated or worse, we needed a line of secession in order to fulfill that seat. So in state, Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Defense, Attorney General, and so on and so forth. Now, the reason why this is set up this way is that the vice president, of course, was elected through the electoral college. And with the electoral college, um, with the electoral college is, was determined by the people in the states. But if something happened to the president, the vice president, they wanted someone who was an elected official of the people in order to lead the country. Now, the Speaker of the House, as you know, when we talked about Congress in chapter uh, six, is elected by the full body of the House. Now, the full body of the House of Representatives are all elected by popular vote by the people throughout the United States. So essentially their representative will choose a speaker who would in the line of secession could become president. Then the president pro tempore of the Senate for the same reason, because the entire body of the Senate chooses the president pro tempore of the Senate. And as you know, both senators of each state, of each state were elected by the people. So that whole body, which were elected by the people and all the representatives of the people vote the president pro tempore of the Senate and the president pro tempore of the Senate, therefore is in the line of session and becoming president. But then this is where I think they didn't go far enough. Even though these members have all been appointed by the president of the United States and approved by the Senate. And yes, it's the same body that has chosen the president pro tempore of the Senate, the secretary of state, secretary of treasury, basically the members of the cabinet would become president due to the line of secession. I think they should modify this and many people may agree 
I may disagree with this. The reason why I think it should be modified is that we should use members of the House and the Senate before we get to the members within uh, the cabinet, simply because that those groups of people were elected directly by the people. In order for us to use our, if we're gonna be a democratic republic, let's use that democratic side and let that person who was chosen by the group. But the argument against that would obviously be that, well, if the next person, the senior person in line is only chosen by one district, and I can understand that, where the entire body of the Senate was chosen by everyone who votes in the United States, and they appointed these individuals. So I can understand, but arguments go any way you want to. The constitutional powers of the president, the appointment power, the power to convene Congress, the power to make treaties, the veto power, the power to preside over the military as commander in chief, and the pardoning power. The appointment power, the president can appoint ambassadors, uh, foreign representatives of the United States to different countries. The president can also appoint judges. The president can appoint Supreme Court judges and the lower federal judges. And the president can appoint cabinet members. Now understand the president can appoint these, but all of these members must be approved by the Senate which of course, again, each member of the Senate is chosen by open elections of the general public. The power to convene Congress, usually used on extraordinary occasions, usually in a time of crisis, or just in order for the president to let Congress know something that's going on. The president has every right to send a letter to Congress to state that they must convene at a specific time in order to be addressed by the executive branch. So the president has that constitutional power. Also, the president must make a report to Congress on the State of the Union every year. Now, until the 1950s, Really, most presidents didn't convene Congress in order to make a State of the Union. The president just simply created a memo and passed it openly to both houses of Congress. But eventually, the president made a speech in front of Congress in order to tout not only uh, what the State of the Union is, but also to tout the work that the president has done. All right, previous. The power to make treaties. Yes, the president has every right to make treaties, no matter what. President Obama made the treaties to the Paris Accords. President Trump uh, just renegotiated the treaties for NAFTA. But regardless, whatever president or what treaties that the president may negotiate, all treaties require ratification, approval through Congress. Receiving ambassadors, the president will receive ambassadors. So let's just say uh, Russia has an ambassador here in the United States. And since President Biden is the new president of the United States, the ambassador can call on to the president for a visit and a, and a sit down speak to recognize the existence of the state of Russia and to talk business and maybe convey information back and forth to the country via their ambassadors. Executive agreements are agreements by presidents to do, to follow a certain overall agreement. Now, executive agreements are like our executive abilities. 
these are not necessarily, they're not approved by the Senate. Executive agreement is like the agreement in which the United States and England has and always to be friendly and to be allies together. This week, President Biden and Boris Johnson with his visit to England, President Biden's visit to England, signed an executive agreement to abide by the old treaty, since abide by an agreement since World War II to continue to be allies. This has been a standing agreement since World War II where every president went to visit England has signed this agreement and kept it. It does not have to be approved by the Senate. However, if Congress and especially the Senate felt that agreement violated the sovereignty of the United States, it could declare it unconstitutional as well as the judicial branch. Qualified negative. So the veto power, the president has the right to veto any law, any law that Congress has passed. And the president can do that. It's written in the constitution. However, if a president wants to veto a law that Congress finds very popular, Congress can override a veto by the president with a two third vote of each chamber of Congress. So say if mm, one of the reasons, uh, uh, let's see, when was the last overridden veto that has happened? It's been a while, but when that happens, usually president have normal objections on it and we'll just simply stew and go to the public and offer and ask for support against Congress for overturning their veto. Sometimes a president's power is the threat of a veto may make Congress nervous, especially if Congress doesn't have the votes to override a president's veto. Congress may change the law in order to fit what the president felt or feels that, that that the president will approve. So just sometimes the power of the president to threaten a veto, especially if there's not enough votes in Congress to override him or write her, Congress will change a law or kill a bill in order to make the president happy or to make sure public support doesn't wait. The power to preside over the military's commander in chief. The president, this is the most important executive power that the president has. The president has power to command all armed forces of the United States. However, the president does not have the right to declare war. Only Congress has the right to declare war. Now, since the War Powers Act resolution is in 1973, uh, Congress realized the president needs some leeway in order to command troops because it has been determined that some military actions must occur without declaring war. So because of the War Powers Act resolution in 1973, a president can launch military operations anywhere in the world at any time, but must notify members of Congress within 48 hours. After that, Congress has 30 days to approve or disapprove that military action. If Congress decides to disapprove of that military action, the president has an additional 60 days to bring back the troops. However, if Congress does approve of that military action, Congress has to review it again within 120 days. And if Congress disapproves at that time, the 
president has 60 days to return the troops. Pardoning power. It's, this is a check on the judicial branch, can be issued before or after a convention, and cannot be used for impeachment. The only greatest example of a presidential pardon was Ford pardons Nixon. So the president can pardon anyone in the federal system of a crime. So let's just say that, uh, well, let's look at President Trump. Several members of his cabinet, of his uh, association, were convicted on federal charges. They were serving sentences in prison. Some had served their full sentences in prison, but they still had a criminal record. Before President Trump left office, President Trump pardoned them, forgive them, wiped away, wiped away their conviction, totally clean slate. President Trump has every right to do that. That is a judicial branch check. That's a balance. Presidents also can issue pardons before or after a conviction. A president can see a person that may be convicted of crime or after a crime can just simply say, I'll give you a pardon of all crimes pertaining to X. President cannot pardon someone who has been impeached. So if you have a judge who has been impeached, president can't pardon him for that. However, if that judge has committed other crimes, and that's why they were impeached, any federal charges thereafter, the president can pardon them. The biggest pardon in history is possible crimes that President Nixon may have committed. In 1975, President Ford pardons President Nixon of any crimes that he may have committed while he was in office. That's the biggest one. The weirdest thing that happened was during President Trump's tenure. And the last several months of President Trump's term was the discussion, can a president pardon himself? Believe it or not, in the Constitution, there is nothing there that says a president can be pardoned. Remember, president can't impo can't pardon anybody for impeachment. Well, Trump was impeached several, twice, but was never convicted. Fine. However, it looks like President Trump may have committed some crimes on the state and federal level. Well, President Trump inquired with his advisors to see if he could pardon himself. Uh, on the federal level. It has never been done before, never really been brought up. However, there is enough judicial, academic, uh, I mean, legal academic writing. And also you have to think of the original intent of the founders for this rule, that a president could not do this. So they believe that something would, of that matter would be considered unconstitutional. And if President Trump did try to pardon himself, it would have been found by the judicial branch and Congress as being unconstitutional. So President Trump didn't do that. However, that means when President Trump left office and when he did, he is subject to federal charges. He is subject to state charges on the federal level anyway. If he is charged with a crime and convicted, the only person now that would be able to pardon would be President Biden. And President Biden has already made the statement that he wouldn't do that. On the state level, only people that can pardon President Trump on a state level would be a governor. The development and expansion of presidential power. Let's see. Uh, Presidential power has grown really 
since 1809 to 1933. Um, if you were to look at presidential power during the dual federalism era between uh, the start of our constitution until 1933, the president really has only basic power over the federal government. Uh, in Barron versus Baltimore, in which uh, the Supreme Court came back that says basically that the Bill of Rights did not apply to states, it only applied to the federal system. That was a precedent enough that says that the power of the presidency should stay on the federal level. With uh, McCullen versus Maryland, it also created de the demarcation between federal authority and state authority. State can never uh, put its authority over the federal and federal more over the state unless it's a specific law or constitutional amendment. So it remained like that essentially until 1933. And then with uh, bills passed by Congress and executive orders by the president of Franklin D. Roosevelt, presidential power and function increased exponentially. Uh, because, and that was called concurrent federalism at that time, in which Franklin Roosevelt basically took over many uh, welfare agencies of states, introduced federal dollars, and were able to provide support for different people who needed money, creating corpor federal corporations, creating uh, different entities other than corporations in order to get the job done. And even the expansion of that during World War II through executive orders as well. But the greatest expansion of presidential power didn't occur until between 1945 until 1980. And that was during the Cold War. And during that time, with the use of category grants and eventually block grants in which Reagan put in place after 1980, federal authority, presidential authority over the states grew. Because in order for states to receive a category grant, states were forced to adopt uh, different measures that Congress uh, that Congress established. And with that establishment of those different measures, the president's authority to enforce or to apply those laws through the Constitution was conveyed. And that expanded the expansion of the presidency. Also, more authority of Congress was delegated to the president, making the president more powerful. Even though, even at this moment, Congress can strip those powers rather easily, but they haven't done that. That's why it seems at times that the president of the United States is the most powerful, or the executive branch is the most powerful institution in, uh, in our country, but understand, Congress has all the power, but what makes Congress weak is when it doesn't work together. Establishing president authority, the first president is George Washington. Basically, it goes over the different uh, aspects of presidential power as it grew, uh, from George Washington to John Adams to Thomas Jefferson, Andrew Jackson, Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The, president, the presidential establishment, the vice president, the cabinet, presidential spouses, the executive office of the president, and the White House staff. The vice president. All right, this may seem a little insulting, but really, this is the only two roles that the vice president really has. Balancing the ticket to make sure wherever the president may be weak, or, or when someone who is running for president may be weak, that vice president is that person to balance out the ticket in a campaign. The vice president though, 
other other than being president pro tem of the Senate, the vice president's job is really waiting for the president to either become incapacitated or die. That's it, really. The vice president's job is defined by the president. If the president feels that the vice president would make a good partner and they work together, such as uh, uh, Jimmy Carter and Mondale, such as uh, uh, Reagan and Bush, such as Clinton and Gore, such as uh, uh, Bush too, and uh, Cheney, such as Obama and Biden, and such as Biden and Harris. The reason why I didn't mention Trump, because Trump was the man. <laughs> Pence was the quiet man, wasn't allowed at all. But most presidents ever since really, really uh, not Nixon, not Ford, but since Reagan, since Carter and Reagan pretty much work closely with their vice president. But all in all, other than being president pro temporary of the Senate, the vice president's job is to simply replace the president after the president becomes incapacitated or dies. The cabinet. The cabinet is just simply the, the different departments under the executive branch. And all the members of those departments, the head of those departments, it's an informal uh, institution, but it's a group of people that, do, that does advise the president, uh, does advise the president on policy. There are heads of the federal agencies and executive departments under the executive branch, and they assist the president in executing laws and making decisions. So let's just say a new law has passed. Um, let's go back to uh, President Bush, too. And during, after 9-11, President Bush signed an executive order creating an executive department called uh, Homeland Security. And what that did, it just simply gave an order that all the branches, all the, uh, all the uh, intelligence branches, as well, all the domestic branches are to work together as if they were an agency. Now, Homeland Security didn't officially become a cabinet position until about a year or two later when Congress approved it. And then all these groups that was in the executive order were actually merged into one agency. And because that agency and President Bush puts it into place, President Bush received uh, uh, advice from all these members within this cabinet that he first created and eventually was approved by Congress but any orders or policies to protect the United States, the homeland, the home, homeland security went out and put them in place and enforced them. Presidential spouses, uh, and former advisors. If we have, uh, we have, we've had first ladies, one day we will have a first gentleman. And the, greatest influence that spouses have, there are informal advisors. There have been some very weak ones that you've never heard of, like our last first lady was a very strong advisor. There's been some strong ones, like the ones listed here and others that advise the president exactly on what to do. And if you want the greatest influence over a president to get the ear of the president, sometimes talk to the spouse. Because we know how houses are run sometimes. Not necessarily that the woman or the guy is in charge of the household, but they had pool. The executive office of the president, the EOP. FDR established to oversee New Deal programs. However, since then, 
the executive office of the president has been has become more uh, of a policy office. Now there are several agencies like the Council of Economic Advisors, Office of Management and Budget, Office of the Vice President, Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, and the National Security Council. These groups on the here, remember the Vice President, are the groups that gives the President as much advice as possible and also helps the President to decide policy which can make changes in the country. Also, the Office of Budget, but Management and Budget is the office that, well, basically says no. It tells the president how much money in the executive branch, in the cabinet, they can spend, the Office of the Vice President, the Office of the US Trade Representative, and the National Security Council will all speak for themselves. The White House staff, uh, it, really, the chief of staff is over the people who come to the White House with the president. The chief of staff is the person who's in charge of every advisor in the White House, every staff member below. This person hires and fires on the direction of the president, no matter what. They're not subject to Senate confirmation. They're not independent legal authority and the power derives from personal relationship with the president. That's it. That most powerful person other than the president and any appointed official in the White House is the chief of staff. And the chief of staff can rule that house like God. However, understand that the chief of staff will last as long as the president. People who work in the White House day in, day out, the permanent people who have been hired from the people who are the secretaries, who clean the White House, who cook in the White House, who do the basic functions of upkeep of the White House every day. Yes, the chief of staff can pretty much uh, tell them what to do, but they are workers they're federal workers, and they have lasted through many a presidents. Presidential leadership and importance of the public opinion. Understand this. This is the most important issue or important item that you need to know about a president. The president of the United States is nothing, I repeat, the President of the United States is nothing if public opinion is not behind the President. The President can't do anything without public opinion. The President needs the public behind them. If the President does not have the public behind them, they can't do anything. Why? Well, remember, who is the biggest boy on the block? Congress. Congress is elected directly by whom? The people. So you people out there who believe that your vote doesn't count, it's another instance where I would say BS. Your vote counts. Your vote counts and your opinion counts. And if you don't support the president, the president has no strength over Congress. Because if you support what the president does and what the president's agenda is and the policy that the president is trying to push through Congress, if you support what the president is trying to do, then the president can go to Congress and says, get my bill passed. Why? Because, and in case of President Biden right now with the infrastructure deal, 68% of the American people approve of it. 68% of the American people believe this should happen. And 68% of the American public will vote either way for you depending upon 
how or what side you fall under this policy. That's how that's leveraged. Because if you got public opinion or Biden on his policy of infrastructure and Congress just sits on it, while it gags, does the regular two-step of, oh, we need to talk about this, we need it, blah, 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 blah. The president can say, okay, we'll do this. And this is something Biden has done. I'm not bragging on Biden or anything, I'm just telling you how public opinion works. Biden has, as of uh, before his trip to England this week, has said, look, you know what? We tried to come to a deal with you on infrastructure. You guys keep on talking to the Republicans. You keep on uh, lowballing it, not trying to negotiate it, not trying to compromise. I wanted to work with you. And I've been going to the public over and over and saying, hey, we need this. The public recognizes what we need in this country more than you. So we're just going to pass it on party lines and like the elections of 2022 decide. Because obviously, you cannot do anything more than say no. That's how Biden is going to frame that. And that's how he can win the day on that. It has happened many times in the past. And right now, Biden's uh, infrastructure uh, policy and bill is very popular. And if it passes on party lines and does bring more jobs to individuals, those Republicans would have to be concerned about their positions as members of Congress in the fall of 2022. So public opinion is everything for the president. And to see President Biden ha has over 63% pop uh, popular, actually a little higher, <laughs> more than when he was elected, to see that a couple of his policies have almost 70% popularity among people, it goes to an understanding why Mitch McConnell, uh, the U.S. Senator, the minority leader, of the Senate now says, oh, well, we, we could still compromise and work with the president here because the numbers are frightening. And they had hoped that the issue at the border would weaken those numbers, and it didn't. Actually, since Biden actually worked harder or has appointed a vice president, the vice president to do something about it, the numbers have gotten stronger. That's why if you were to read some of the uh, uh, reports of criticism of Republicans, especially uh, partisan uh, media against the vice president and her work down there, it's all done to weigh popular opinion against the president. But it is not working right now. So President Biden has a good window of popular public opinion. But when it starts going south, it will weaken him more and more. And a lot of his policies will be harder to pass. And that's it. So basically, the president's office is powerful. The executive branch is powerful, but the executive branch truly is only as powerful as public opinion will allow. Yes, constitutionally, presidents have a lot of power. Presidents also have a lot of power by what authority Congress has delegated to them. Presidents have gained more power since 1933. But presidential power is nothing without public opinion. And once 
the public have turned against the president, then the president becomes more and more impotent. That is how the executive branch works, and it's a good way. Because every time I see this more and more and see how the Constitution works and, this, uh, and how the checks and balances work, I know these guys created this thing and did a lot of compromises. And I understand the logic uh, of Rousseau, the logic of Locke, the logic of Hobbes, the logic of Aquinas. And what, what I mean by that, it's talking about the true history of how the Constitution came into being. And then, of course, the Constitution eventually. But to put all these concepts in hopes that they would work out and over some 200 and almost, what is this now? Um, 200 and almost 40 years later to see this work out like this is amazing. Uh, the, the events on January 6th of this year, 2021, you saw an insurrection. I'm going to call it what it is. It's a lot of people who uh, were convinced that the election wasn't fair. And that's not correct. The election was fair. But you see a group of people that tried to take over Congress in order to change that result. And let's say if they took over Congress, got the ballots that were sent from the states from the Electoral College and destroyed them. The way the Constitution was and the way it works prevented them, no matter what they did, would have never changed the results. There would have been a new president on January 21st, like there was. The states had already registered with their states. Only thing that was happening is a communication. And to take the box away, to burn it, to do whatever, or to disrupt the process of certification before Congress, uh, the electoral, uh, uh, electoral college of results wouldn't have done anything. It's a sign of vast ignorance of our government. It's a sign that uh, social media and other news reports can give people a false assumption about how uh, our government works, especially how the presidency works. And this is one of the reasons why I teach this class. And this is one of the reasons why I tell people who are out there voting that your vote counts, no matter what your vote counts. If your vote didn't count, why are there so many people out there trying to obstruct your vote, trying to argue with your vote, or form an insurrection thinking that their votes have been taken? Because voting counts. And once you don't vote, you alienate yourself and 100 people. And how you alienate 100 people? Simply because of your influence. So what you should do is make sure, no matter what, you vote for your member of Congress. You vote on election day for president. You vote for our city council. You vote for you vote for our county. You vote for state legislator and governor and other departments. You vote for school board. You vote. That is your power. And in order to gain more power, you bring more people together. And as we'll see later on in public opinion, in campaigns public policy, you'll see how strong your vote is. But until next time, which will be chapter uh, chapter eight, which is a complement to chapter seven, it's the president and the executive bureaucracy. Until next time, remember to do your best, think critically, God bless you, and I'll see you then.